start by telling you that um, uh, the real honor here is to be present at the founding almost of your uh, Robert Jackson Center in of court. That's a very, very important thing for us in Washington and me in particular. And I uh, congratulate you and everybody who's in the inn on, on uh, this uh, great start. And I've told Greg that I will, uh, as president, pass of the Bryant Inn and official of the, of the inn, do everything I can to help you with programs and speakers and so forth. Because it's very important that the inn uh, program be uh, spread about the country and particularly uh, in this part of the country. There are over, to my knowledge, 260 inns of court around the country, and uh, <clears throat> this will add to our uh, splendid record, but I, I uh, very much appreciate uh, being asked to come here to talk about John Hinckley. Uh, my topic is the John Hinckley case and the trial of the future. Um, it's interesting, the John Hinckley case, of course, occurred uh, 25 years ago, hard to believe, but it did, but it still inspires tremendous interest. Um, I find with some audiences the need to go back and explain a bit about the background, although uh, I think with this audience it won't be too difficult because uh, uh, times I've talked to law school audiences, I've found that many folks had uh, indicated that later they were three and four years old when this happened, but I think everybody remembers essentially what happened. Um, I'd never seen this, this uh, video before, and it's quite graphic and quite detailed and, and quite accurate. I, I'm going to talk about that in the context of the trial of John Hinckley, which is uh, important to talk about for several reasons. First of all, it is uh, <clears throat> one of the epical trials of, of this last century and has been uh, analyzed and, and scrutinized. Secondly, it resulted in a, a drastic change in the law of, uh, shall I say, insanity for the last time, but criminal responsibility for the law of criminal responsibility, um, not only in the federal system, but going forward in the, in the state system, and we'll talk about that. Um, before 1981, uh, Greg mentioned I was an assistant U.S. attorney in Washington. Some of you may know that there the United States attorney wears two hats. He or she is both the federal prosecutor, but also the local DA. And therefore, in Washington, we try, as prosecutors, uh, all types of cases. So I. I spent a lot of time in federal court trying crimes of violence, robberies, murders, and kidnapping. And because of uh, <clears throat> the law in the District of Columbia, uh, many people charged with serious crimes, murders in particular, raised the defense of insanity over the years. So I had uh, a lot of experience dealing with that defense as a prosecutor. And we'll talk about some of the, the ins and outs of, of dealing with that. And by the way, uh, I certainly plan to give a speech and lecture, but uh, don't want to exclude anybody from questions. And uh, Greg and I feel that uh, it, as we go along, if you have questions, raise your hand and uh, let your question be known and, uh, rather than wait till the end because I think uh, there will be things that I might say that are provocative or not provocative or not clear and um, let me know so we can talk about that. Um, <clears throat> John Hinckley, I, I, of course, came to this uh, event uh, to totally without knowledge of all this going on with Mr. Hinckley. Mr. Hinckley, as it turns out, had a history uh, that runs back for many years. I, I should begin by telling you this in terms of the insanity defense and the trial of these cases. Uh, <clears throat> the peculiarity of the insanity defense is, unlike most criminal cases, in criminal cases typically the issues are who did it or what was done, first degree, second degree, did A do it, B do it, or C? And that's really the scope of the, of the inquiry and the scope of the relevance. But in the insanity case, the jury wrestles with the tougher question of why something was done. Why something was done. And we'll see here that the courts are not uh, necessarily equipped to have juries deal with those questions, and certainly the experts, in some people's point of view, are not equipped to deal with those either. But that is the undertaking of the insanity defense. In the District of Columbia, the standard for criminal responsibility, which we'll display up here in a few minutes, at the time Hinckley was tried, was quite liberal. It was the so-called American Law Institute, or ALI test. And that, uh, coupled with DC case law, made the defense available to anyone with a mental disorder. And a mental disorder then was defined, and I say then, 
as any abnormal condition of the mind that substantially impairs behavioral controls or behavioral processes. Think about that. Any abnormal uh, mental condition. Now, that's pretty broad and, and so forth. So that gave rise to a lot of litigation. It also gave rise in the District of Columbia to uh, experts having a strong say in the trials of insanity defenses. That they didn't tell the jury what to decide, but they gave testimony based on their, their profession, their discipline, that uh, perhaps was esoteric, perhaps was too scientific, but nevertheless was relevant. The other important thing about the insanity defense, most notably in Washington, D.C., because of the broad standards, and this, was, this is a standard we tried Hinckley under, uh, virtually anything was relevant. In other words, the typical criminal case, somebody holds up a liquor store, somebody shoots someone, somebody hijacks a truck, the issues are what happened then and there. Okay. We do not, in the typical hijacking criminal case or in the typical robbery, allow the defense to put in evidence of how the defendant fared in school 12 years ago, whether he liked the Beatles, uh, whether his parents disagreed with him, and so forth. We do allow that when the defense of insanity is raised because uh, the approach of the courts then was that in order for the doctors to fully understand the mental condition of a patient, in order for the doctors, to, the psychiatrists here, to testify about uh, mental disease or defect, they have to put forth and they have to understand all of a person's background. And certainly within the profession of psychiatry and forensic psychology, that is true. Now, when I was young, uh, there was a TV show uh, called uh, This Is Your Life. You may recall Ralph Edwards would come out every week with a big book and he'd say, Joe Blow, and he'd open, this is your life. And uh, Blow would be stunned. And then he would call out Ralph Edwards, his third grade teacher, Betty, Miss, Miss Betty Jones, and she would tell a story, and his sixth grade <clears throat> girlfriend, and his eighth grade football coach, and the whole pun up would, would, would be presented uh, <clears throat> in this device. It was a wonderful show. I think it's been revived, but in any event, it, it lasted for a long time. That is a standard of relevance that did exist, that did exist at the time Hinckley was tried. In other words, any background information that had relevance on mental state would be admissible. And let me say, that cut on both sides. The prosecution could introduce evidence to rebut insanity that was well outside the typical scope of relevance. And we'll see in the Hinckley case how that happened. All of this, by the way, presented to a jury uh, that doesn't know, by, by definition, they're selected because they don't know much about the case, because they don't have knowledge of the parties, and because they are uh, sworn to be neutral. And to a jury that at that time were uh, committed to listen to the t testimony very carefully, and as some of you are doing now, not take notes, not ask questions. Uh, the evidence was not argued to them until the end of the case. The trial of Hinckley's uh, case on the merits lasted from the latter part of April 1982 until June 21st, 1982. All during that time, there was a, a, a steady five-day-a-week presentation of complex testimony. But all during that time, there was no argument to the jury, no discussion, no instructions, not because of any nefarious approach, but simply because that was the procedure at the time. That sequence of events has uh, somewhat uh, been, been changed, not in insanity cases, of which there are few at this day, but in complex cases generally, which I'm going to talk about, because over the last 10 years or so, I've been involved in complex civil cases, and there have been devices that have been evolved uh, to aid jury understanding, jury assistance, and hopefully uh, the process. Hinckley came to Washington shortly before March 30, 1981. As you know, probably he had had a troubled relationship with his parents. He was from Evergreen, Colorado. His father uh, and mother uh, cared for him, obviously. Uh, there was a time, however, that he was, he was uh, banned from the house. He just wasn't making it, wasn't doing things uh, that they expected. They had two other children. Uh, who had uh, Scott and Diane, who had, who had succeeded in, in their careers in life, and John just didn't do that. Uh, John told his father he wanted to write songs, he wanted to be a writer, uh, that he was going to go to college at Texas Tech, and basically none of that was true. Uh, he kept uh, receiving money from his parents. Uh, he became a wanderer, that is, wandering about the country. Uh, he also had a habit of 
purchasing guns, as we'll see. Uh, and he became certainly alienated and a loner. Now, looking back on this, from this perspective, you can see he fits the pattern uh, of many people who have done violent acts against political figures. But basically, all of this was kept from certainly his family and from other people who, who could have intervened. Uh, Jodie Foster, of course, you saw a vignette of her, didn't know John Hinckley. She was a student at Yale. She was 18 at the time of the shooting. Uh, he had called her. He had sent her letters, but there was no connection between them. But he uh, became infatuated with her because of a movie, Taxi Driver. Some of you may have seen that movie. It was shown partly here, Robert De Niro's movie. And Hinckley watched Taxi Driver, by his own account, uh, 20 or 25 times. And the movie was produced in 1976, and Hinckley was uh, basically obsessed with, with Ms. Foster and her, her role in Taxi Driver. Um, and that became a part of the trial, became actually part of the, uh, the evidence. On March 30, 1981, uh, as is depicted in the vignette here, uh, Hinckley was in Washington at a hotel. He checked in beforehand. He wrote a letter to Jody Foster, which we're going to see in, in some of the clips that I present to you. Um, and left it in the room. Also in the room, but was not shown here, was a uh, page from the Washington Star, the old Washington Star newspaper, that had the president's itinerary for the day, because the Washington Star every day would print the president's itinerary. And uh, he had that on his, on his bed, and it showed that the president would be at the Washington Hilton Hotel to speak to a labor group in the early afternoon. And Hinckley saw that and away he went. Before he left, besides writing the letter, he did something else, many other things, but one thing in particular that was very important. He had a gun. You saw it briefly here in the, in the, in the clip. Uh, basically a Saturday night special that he had bought uh, on the open market. And he loaded it with bullets. But the bullets that he selected from all of his collection of, of bullets were devastator bullets. These are bullets that explode upon impact. And we made much, we the government, about that at the trial, that he selected certain bullets that would cause the most severe damage. Um, all of this gets to the, to the task we had at hand to not prove him sane, but to prove him criminally uh, responsible. Hinckley went to the hotel. There was a, a huge number of press people standing there waiting for the president. Hinckley got in the crowd, and he was literally standing there with the national press reporters, gun in his pocket, when Reagan showed up. Mr. Reagan went into the hotel. Hinckley didn't pull his gun, didn't shoot him. Shortly thereafter, about a half hour later, he came out. And at that point, Mr. Reagan got into the limo. And you saw the horrible scene there where Mr. Hinckley shot uh, six shots. He hit four people. He hit Jim Brady. He hit uh, Tim McCarthy, policeman Tom Delahanty, and, of course, the president. The president's shot was a ricochet uh, off of the car and lodged in the president's side. Um, and he did that, by the way. Uh, in what I would call combat position, like that. Some of us were taught in the Army how to shoot in that fashion. All of this became important from our point of view about how he was able to conform behavior and how he could act deliberately. Hinckley was caught immediately, taken into custody, uh, taken to the police station, and then the FBI. Um, at the police station, he was advised of rights. He immediately said, that he wanted a lawyer. But not only did he want a lawyer, but he gave the guy's name, a lawyer in Dallas, Texas, who apparently was a business friend, a lawyer for his father. So I can just imagine this poor fellow sitting in his office in Dallas getting a phone call. Mr. So-and-so, uh, a man shot the President of the United States, and he wants you to represent him. And the guy said, look, it's Friday. I don't want to get into it. You know. <laughs> but he did. Now, that becomes important, because even though he asked for counsel, uh, it was decided once the matter was handed over to the FBI and the security agencies to ask him questions in addition. Uh, as, as it went on, the judge, I'm moving ahead for a minute here, the judge, uh, upon defense motion, suppressed the statements he made. Uh, now, of course, the, the crime occurred on videotapes. There was no doubt who did what. Remember I told you the, story, the, the points, who did it and what was done. There's no doubt about that. The importance, of, though, of Hinckley's dialogue is this from our point of view, to, to show not that he's sane, but that he's criminally responsible. It's necessary to show a lot of things, including that he was in contact with reality. That night, 
those, I know Greg knew this, but many others know that it was the night of the national basketball final. LSU was playing, who knows, I don't know, in the national final. Hinckley started to talk to the agents about that. He's telling them, you know, I really like uh, a fellow named Brown, the coach of the, of the LSU, and I like this team. You know, shooting back and forth. Relevant to the shooting? Nah. Relevant to his mental condition? You bet. It shows he's in contact with reality. Because as the trial progressed later on the next year, one of the defense efforts was to show that he was schizophrenic and that therefore it was not in contact with reality in the sense. But we needed that, that, um, that evidence, that simple evidence that he was talking basketball properly, appropriately with the agents. The court uh, decided to suppress that. We appealed. Uh, the Court of Appeals affirmed. I might add later, some years later, the Supreme Court in another case issued an opinion that basically um, uh, permitted that type of evidence to rebut an insanity defense. Um, talk about the trial here. Uh, this was a trial trying the defense of insanity. And again, I'm going to say, when I say insanity, I mean CR, criminal responsibility. Um, both sides immediately, at the time of the shooting, recognized that this would be the defense. And both sides, within a few days of the shooting, March 30th, uh, began to obtain the services of forensic psychiatrists. You know, people get lawyered up, well, we got psychiatrists up, if you will. Uh, this was an unusual case in many respects, one of which is the defendant's father owned an oil company, and therefore not like your typical defendant, he had substantial resources, or his dad did, uh, to uh, expend upon defense. The firm selected was not the, the gentleman lawyer in, in, in Dallas, but Williams and Connolly. And Williams and Connolly from Washington, D.C., was founded by Edward Bennett Williams, who some of you know was the trial lawyer's trial lawyer. He passed in the late 80s. But Mr. Williams and his firm then and now are the gold standard of trial law in, in, in the United States, in my view. The particular lawyer in charge of the case was Vince Fuller, who was a senior partner of Mr. Williams, uh, and assisted by a guy named Greg Craig. Uh, Vince has passed a few years ago, but he was the lead trial lawyer in the case for the Williams firm. I was assisted by two very fine assistant U.S. attorneys. We had a trial team, uh, a fellow named Dick Chapman and Mark Tucker, uh, along with, of course, a, a phalange of FBI agents, police, uh, other support. So it was a fight uh, drawn in Olympian uh, measure. That is to say, both sides had resources, both sides had support. Our psychiatrists uh, came in two categories. One, Mr. Hinckley was immediately sent to a mental hospital in the federal system at Butner, North Carolina. He is ex examined there by the chief forensic psychiatrist, a woman by the name of Dr. Sally Johnson. She later became a witness for us at the trial. Also, we obtained the government the services of several forensic psychiatrists who formed a team to examine him. Uh, most notably, Dr. Park Dietz, some of you may know about him, and we'll talk about him a little, little more. Uh, Dr. Jonas Rappaport, who is the Dean of the Forensic Psychiatry World. Dr. Jim Cavanaugh from Chicago, Rush Presbyterian, and psychologist John Monahan. The defense had several uh, psychiatrists, uh, William Carpenter, Tom Goldman, both of them uh, experienced psychiatrists, although Mr. Goldman was, a, was an experienced uh, forensic psychiatrist, in other words, a court psychiatrist. Uh, Dr. Dr. Carpenter was not. However, Dr. Carpenter's specialty was schizophrenia, so he was presented uh, to support that. So immediately we started then into the issue of investigating the case, but the case we're investigating was not so much what was done, but why it was done. Uh, I should tell you that we, we voluntarily and I think wisely set up a wall between us and the psychiatrists that we obtained. In other words, we didn't want to know what they were doing or vice versa. We gave them factual information. We never asked them throughout the process until they came to their conclusions what they were seeing and what they were deciding. Uh, it's hard to say how the defense worked because they have a mechanism protected by the Fifth Amendment. So we, we don't really know that. But the government in this situation, uh, we uh, set up a wall that worked very well. Because the last thing in the world we wanted to have happen is have one of our doctors say, well, gee, you got this idea when you talked to Edelman and so forth and so on. And we didn't do that. Although we interacted with them, we gave them facts information, we never, ever looked over the fence to see uh, what they were doing. Um, 
in terms of presenting the case and tactics and strategy, um, the insanity defense is tried a little bit different in federal courts than uh, the ordinary case. And primarily because at that time, on the issue of insanity, the prosecution, the government, had the burden of proof beyond a reasonable doubt. In a criminal case, that's a standard, of course, for all critical facts. But when a defense raises insanity at that time, since 1895 in the federal courts, the government has to prove sanity beyond a reasonable doubt. So we'll think about that. For that reason, for that reason, uh, it became important for us to deal with the case in the following fashion. Let me talk about the, the, the litigation sequence. Opening statements were devoted to for mine, for what happened in the case. The defense got up and said, oh yeah, that happened, but he was insane at the time. Our case in chief, the direct case proof, of course, consisted of the videos and other details, including ballistics evidence, the devastator bullets. There was a box of devastator bullets found in Mr. Hinckley's hotel room, uh, the Jody letter, which we'll talk about in a second, and, and quite a bit of other factual evidence. Uh, yes, to prove the case, but also to lay the foundation for our rebuttal. Then the defendant put on their defense of insanity. We'll talk a bit about that, their testimony, their witnesses. Then we, the government, put on our rebuttal, which is the main part of our presentation. Now that's different than the way ordinary cases are tried because we had the burden of proof. We had, in effect, to have the last say. In this particular case, Judge Parker, Barrington Parker, decided that after our rebuttal, the defense could sir rebut. That's discretionary with him. And then the case after closings, went to the jury. Now, there are two vastly different approaches between the prosecution and defense as to how to deal with the issue of insanity. Fundamentally, our approach was to deal with the reality that our doctors recognized that Mr. Hinckley had a mental disorder in the sense that he had personality disorders. You know there is a spectrum of mental disorders uh, from personality disorders to affective disorders, to serious psychotic disorders. I, I know enough psychiatry to get myself into trouble, that's about it. But uh, our doctor started out by saying, yes, he has uh, personality disorders. But I tell you very quickly, for people with personality disorders function in everyday life. You probably deal with them. Uh, if you watch some of the TV talk shows, you see narcissistic personalities, usually whoever comes and sits on the couch and says, you know, hello, Jay, it's good to see you tonight. I'm in this great movie, you know, straight in, okay. So uh, that was the approach. The other approach from the, from the government point of view was emphasize the facts. Because no matter what his disorder was called by their, by their psychiatrist, the questions we wanted to have decided were, could he appreciate the wrongfulness of his conduct and conform his behavior to the requirements of the law, no matter what his problem was? And therefore, we presented factual evidence to show that. For instance, we found the maid in the hotel. The hotel had been serviced by a maid hotel room of John Hinckley shortly before he left. We found her, called her to testify. She was a very nice lady. And the $64 question for her was, did you talk with him? Yes. Did you notice anything out of order? No. Did he do anything bizarre? No. So forth and so on. Thank you very much. We called the FBI, a secret service agent rather, who jumped on him at the scene and arrested him, who rode down to the police station with him. Uh, and again, we asked him those same questions. Uh, we also found a maid who worked at a motel in uh, Englewood, Colorado, which is where Hinckley had been just before he came to Washington, and she interacted with him quite a bit. And again, asked her those same questions. Did he act strange? Did he do anything unusual? Did you think he's odd? So forth and so on. That was our approach to the case. And I'll show you in a minute some of the testimony um, uh, that we introduced, both from Park Dietz, the forensic psychiatrist that we, we featured, and cross-examination of, of Bill Carpenter, who was the defense attorney. Um, so our, our fundamental approach was jury, no matter what he did, he could appreciate and conform. No matter what label you put on it, from a psychiatric point of view, he could appreciate and conform. The defense took the opposite position. The defense approach was basically medical, that is to say, he's schizophrenic. That's a, that's a terrible thing to be called schizophrenic. You know, you probably wouldn't want to associate with somebody called schizophrenic. And they said, yes, he fit all the criteria for schizophrenia. He showed these characteristics of schizophrenia. 
and so forth. And as I say, there were several psychiatrists who testified uh, for the defense. And he, uh, Hinckley did not testify, and wisely so, because I think had he testified, you know, the jury would have gotten to see and hear him sort of verbatim, if you will. The only proof of his words came in through the video, uh, the audio tapes that you heard here. He made some tapes talking to Jody Foster, and he made that New Year's Eve tape that you heard excerpts of here. And that's all the jury heard of him. Very uh, troubling tapes, certainly. Very troubling tapes. Um, it's, it's also very interesting that um, uh, we made uh, much of the fact that besides loading the gun, he took it with him, he hid it in his, po his coat pocket, he, he did not disclose to anybody his intent, purpose, or plan, and he was able to successfully do that in a situation where there were police all around, uh, the, the president, there, there was Secret Service inspection, and so forth, so that he, he was able to be a successful uh, uh, assassin, if you will. All this goes, in our, in our judgment, to the ability to appreciate uh, and conform. I mentioned Dr. Park Dietz. Uh, he testified, along with Dr. Johnson, uh, Dr. Johnson, by the way, testified uh, first for us because she saw Hinckley a few days after the shooting. She was the first one to talk to him. She spent a lot of time with him. She was a very, very good examiner of, of patients and operated independently. In other words, we, again, didn't deal with her. We didn't know how she was going to come out. And she essentially agreed with our principal psychiatrist about his mental disorders and his ability to appreciate and conform. He also made statements and admissions to her about what he did and what he thought, that as time went on, as more doctors talked to him, he modified. So we argued that basically he told her the true story when they first met, I think it was April 3rd, uh, in, in Butner, North Carolina. And therefore, he may have been gilding the lily as, as time went on. Uh, that's called in, in the psycho, uh, psycho jargon, malingering. Lingering. And uh, there was certainly an element of that there. Indeed, uh, one of the psychiatrists for Hinckley um, did the following. You may know there's a book called the, the DSM, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. It's uh, quite a thing to read because it has every kind of mental disorder you can see. And they have it set out for doctors to, to use. It's not, a it's not a forensic device, it's a diagnostic device. And it has several criteria, a little list of things that make out various disorders. This particular doctor for Mr. Hinckley showed him the book and had him check off. In other words, it's a, you know, it's sort of do-it-yourself psychiatry, if you will. And of course, we made much of that on cross-examination. Uh, he, he, he tipped his hand, if you will, and of course, Hinckley said, yep, 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 therefore I'm, I'm schizophrenic and so forth. Uh, he, our view was that Hinckley was a deceptive person and a manipulative person, and uh, as I say, Dr. Johnson was the first person to, to talk um, to him. The defense also presented, uh, besides the, the, the oral statements of Hinckley, some of his writings. Hinckley was a, I was a, uh, forget the word, hypographic, means he writes a lot. You know, psychiatrists can't say anything in, in short terms, but he's hypographic. And so he wrote stuff uh, not too good. He's certainly not Ernest Hemingway, but he wrote poetry. And a lot of that was found in his house at the uh, Evergreen Colorado House when the FBI searched it, and the defense introduced some of his more uh, audacious poems. Uh, I remember one about blood on the moon and things like that. And of course the jury gets to see that and they say, my goodness, my goodness, you know, uh, this man does not have you know, all of his marbles, to put it simply. So as you can see, it was a very closely contested um, issue. I want to uh, show, first of all, a, uh, well, let, let me say a couple of things about, about the defense. The defense essentially was ipso facto. That being, hey, this guy, 29 years old, shot a, um, uh, 26, shot a, shot a president of the United States to impress a movie star? Okay, you know, next case. That, that basically was their argument. Uh, secondly, uh, to show you the closeness of the case, uh, you saw that note that Hinckley wrote to Jody Foster, that letter. Both sides wanted to put that in. We wanted to put it in to show he can write English, he, it's logically organized, it makes sense, it's purposeful, it's relevant, and so forth. Sure. They wanted to put it in to show just the opposite. It doesn't ramble all over the page, but the ideas contained therein are, are somewhat bizarre and, and, and crazy, as they would say. 
Um, also, we had drawn up a map of Hinckley's trips around the country. He would go back and forth and travel east and west and north and south on buses and such. We wanted to show that he was able to navigate through the country successfully. In other words, he could organize his behavior and such. They wanted to put it in to show, hey, this is, this is uncontrolled sort of, sort of ping pong type behavior. Uh, and frankly, both arguments are right. Both, both arguments support the proposition that the side putting it in wants to, wants to advance. That's why it was a difficult case. That's why it was hard, because the same evidence supported uh, two conclusions. Yep. Yeah, Jody Foster testified, but she testified in a deposition. She was not in front of the jury. Her lawyer, I believe, raised some schedule problems. She testified. Hinckley was there. He was present at the deposition. It was videotaped. Uh, and um, she at one point testified, and he apparently threw a pen. I wasn't there. Threw a pen at her. Didn't hit her. Uh, but uh, he was quite a distance away. He was displeased with her testimony. But she was not a witness at, at the trial. Um, I think she was probably making a movie, I don't know. Um, I want to show, we have some slides here that uh, uh, I brought and have been produced for me by the uh, investigators here that will, that's just the scene of the Hilton in Washington, D.C. The only difference then and now is they have built a protective uh, uh, tunnel over the area where President Reagan was shot, so this could not happen again. There it is, and uh, this is after the event, of course, but um, this is the entrance that Hinckley was standing at. We'll see a better shot of that in a minute. It was a warm, rainy day. There he is. There's the press, and you can see young John. Did everybody see him? No. Uh, he's under the umbrella. Uh, behind. Oh. Yeah. This gentleman's name is Shelley Fieldman. He's an NBC cameraman. The rest of these people are press people. <laughs> Sam Donaldson was there, too. We interview all of them. He was just standing there, uh, if you will. Okay. Here comes the president out. This is his wave. Tim McCarthy's to the right, the Secret Service agent. Jerry Parr, who saved the president's life, is the gentleman in the raincoat. Jim Brady is between the president and Mr. Parr. Uh, there's the shooting and the first, first shot of the shooting. And immediately, uh, Mr. Reagan is, is rushed into the car by Jerry Parr. Here's Tim McCarthy at the front of the car, and eventually you'll see him. You don't see it here, but he turns around and takes one right in the chest for the president. Tim McCarthy played defensive back for the University of Illinois. He was in great shape, tough guy, uh, and frankly, you know, was going to put one in there for the president. This is the aftermath. There's Mr. Brady on the ground. The other gentleman is, is Officer Delahanty, uh, who was shot, not severely, but uh, Mr. Brady, as you all know, was, was, was seriously wounded by uh, a shot directly to his brain, his skull, uh, with a devastator bullet. Secret Service agents are all around here, and of course the press. So um, you, there's no question, as I say, as to what was done. Another shot, Delahanty and Brady. Craig Fuller is there with him. Uh, the, Craig Fuller's on the ground with Mr. Brady. He has been detained, thrown into the car. They've got him. I guess you don't see him now, but they have him in the car on the way down to the police station. More shots. There's Hinckley getting into the police car, I think, yeah. I think they've got him there, pushing him to the ground. Yep. The agent here, by the way, is Danny Spriggs. Spriggs? See what we've got? Secret Service agent. Uh, as a light aside to all of this, uh, at the trial we put him on because he wrote down to the police station with Hinckley. We asked him the same questions. Did he act unusual? Did he say anything bizarre? So forth and so on. On cross-examination, the defense asked Danny Spriggs, well, this was an exciting traumatic event. Yes, it was. Um, weren't you upset? He said, no. Redirect. Agent Spriggs, have you ever been in exciting traumatic events before? Oh, yes. How was that? I played four years of defensive back for the Cowboys. So, it was funny, I thought, anyway, so, and, uh, okay, Delahanty, Brady on the ground, there's the weapon, typical Saturday night special, you bought it in Dallas, and just walked in at the time and you could buy a gun, loaded with devastator bullets, 
There's the President's car, and you can see some of the marks in the car from the bullet that ricocheted uh, off of the car and into the President. We're going to see another shot of it there. And this is a bulletproof vehicle, by the way. There's a bullet in the windshield. The two other shots hit across the street. Get another shot. There's one of the bullets that I believe hit the President. These are devastated bullets. I'm not sure whether this is the President or, or Mr. Brady. Uh, this is Hinkley's hotel room. Uh, we saw that in, in the video clip. This is the way he left it. You see there on the bed, the, the Washington Star newspaper. There's a better shot of it in a minute. Get a better one, I think. It's on 18th Street Northwest. It's about a mile and a half from the Hilton. It was raining that day, so Mr. Hinckley decided to take a taxi. Uh, we made much of that. He also said, he also told the examining psychiatrist that when he got there at 1.30, uh, Mr. Reagan had come in, but he, and he didn't want to stand out in the rain. He didn't want to get wet. Well, now, this is a guy who claims through a psychiatrist that he was driven to do this. Well, if you're driven to do this, what do you care about the rain? And so forth. So this is one way we dealt with this. Anyway, there it is. Uh, you can see, at least I can see, uh, as the president's schedule and indicates where he's going to be. The Washington Star stopped printing this the next day. And, and the Post still does not do that. There it is. And here it says, the Parts White House from Washington Hotel and so forth. He had that right out on the bed. Now, here's a collection of his ammunition, all his other writings. Uh, books that he carried with him. I'm not going to go through all of them, but Dr. Dietz, who are a leading psychiatrist that we used, went through everything. He read all of his books, uh, everything that influenced his mind. Uh, I think we'll see a shot here of the Devastator bullet. Oh, there's the letter to Jody. And from our point of view, it's, it's certainly well written, it's logical, it's not something you know, most people would write, but it's not scribbling all over, over the wall. And he left it there, showing that he intended not to come back which he didn't, but he thought, he thought he'd be killed by the Secret Service. And he concludes, I love you forever, John Hinckley. Now, here's, uh, here's one of his poems. Remember I told you the defense introduced the poem. Can, can you read that from there? The poem's called Guns Are Fun. And uh, basically he's saying, he concludes, guns are lovable, guns are fun. Are you lucky enough to own them? They introduced that. Uh, we had to deal with that. We had to deal with that. Uh, but certainly it, it presents some real issues in terms of showing this man is sane. And there are other, other there's the devastator bullet uh, uh, package. Those of you who hunt may know that these are lethal. And there's the uh, empty casing in which the devastator bullets were, were uh, kept. And there's one of the devastator bullets, I believe. Um, we put this in here because <clears throat> besides showing the facts of March 30, we also proved, as we were entitled to do, previous events. One of them was that he stalked President Carter in 1980 when President Carter was campaigning. This was in, in I believe, Dayton, Ohio. Yeah. And there's a picture, I don't think we offered it here, but I mean, we did offer it, but not here, of Mr. Hinckley in the crowd. A large number of people were there to greet the president. Uh, he claimed he did not have a gun. But uh, who knows whether that was true. But he was, he was going after Mr. He was following Mr. Carter. There he is before the shooting. This is Hinckley in front of Ford's Theater in Washington sometime before. Of course, you all know what happened there. So, thanks. Um, now, I summarized the trial here. I would like to take a moment, the moments are fleeing here, to ask you, we've handed out some material here, I'm not going to go through it all uh, here, but it says um, prosecution expert testimony, and attached to that is um, another excerpt called cross-examination of defense psychiatrist. Just to repeat, prosecution expert testimony, behind which is cross-examination of defense psychiatrist. This is the actual transcript from the trial. I uh, am working with Dr. Dietz. Uh, he and I have become friends over the years. Uh, Dr. Dietz has 
emerge from uh, this case is the leading forensic psychiatrist in the United States. He testifies in all the large cases. We're not there yet, but that's all right. Uh, all, all, the, all the important cases in, in the United States and has cut uh, quite, a, quite a swath in career for himself. He and I are preparing a program for experts as to how to testify. Now, you may be surprised. Experts don't know how to testify. Well, they know how to be experts. Some people who are trial lawyers are agreeing with me. They know how to be experts in medicine or physiology or mathematics, but they don't know how to testify. Uh, this excerpt from Dietz, and again, I won't do anything but just advertise it to you, shows a direct examination of him on one point, which was the claim that the defense made that Hinckley was experiencing something, experiencing something called an idea of reference. That is to say that Reagan looked at him and therefore Reagan was sending him a message. And you'll see, and again, I'm not going to go through this, at points one to five, how Dietz clearly and persuasively, in my view, and with detailed reference to the facts in the interview, rebuts the claim. This is to give you a flavor of what psychiatric testimony is all about. And this is the direct examination. You can imagine, by the way, the, the, the uh, job of the jury here to evaluate all of this over time. The next uh, excerpt is cross-examination of a defense psychiatrist. I think you probably know who the cross-examiner was. Uh, the defense psychiatrist was Bill Carpenter, who was testified for Mr. Hinckley. Here the cross is seeking to show that Mr. Hinckley appreciated wrongfulness. In other words, what he was doing was wrong by showing at point one that he carried a gun concealed, number two, that he had it in his pocket, uh, three, and 3A, if you will, uh, trying to keep his intentions from the, the attentions of the police. Uh, and four, concluding, he was able then, in other words, to conceal his intent from third parties who might interfere with his plan. Sort of innocuous testimony, but if you think about it, it provides the basis for an argument to the jury that was made that regardless of what his problems were, he could appreciate the wrongfulness of his conduct. Um, so that gives you an idea um, of uh, the examination. And this went on for some time, as I say, in this case. Result. Everybody knows the jury found Mr. Hinckley not guilty by reason of insanity on all counts. That occurred on June 21st uh, after three days or more of deliberations by a jury, unanimous verdict. Um, Greg asked me today, did you talk to the jurors? I said, no, I, I don't do that uh, for a number of reasons. One of them is, uh, Greg mentioned, I learned my trade from two people in the courtroom. One of them is a guy named Victor Caputi. Victor Caputi is a pass from this world, although he's probably looking at me tonight. Buffalo native. Uh, his father worked in the docks, went to Canisius College, and was the most fearsome prosecutor we ever had in Washington. He, he tried cases there, and he was a prosecutor for 37 years. And you could do no right in his eyes. You gotta be tough! You know, he, he'd tell you that right in court. You gotta do this! And yet he was a wonderful, lovable man. In the 30s up here, he was a stump speaker. At that time, they didn't have microphones. He would just get up and speak on the stage in this volcanic voice. So Vic specialty became cross-examination of psychiatrists, and uh, I sort of learned a bit from him. One of his lessons was, after the verdict, it's over with. Don't go talk to the jurors, because there's nothing that can be gained. Now, usually you win the case, so you, there's nothing that can be gained. So we did not examine the jurors. I don't think the defense did either. The press tried to and I'm not certain that they were successful. However, a very unusual thing did happen. Verdicts returned 21 June. Uh, about a week or so later, the Congress, right up the street from us in the Capitol, had hearings on the insanity defense, and they subpoenaed some of the jurors. Now, I don't know how many testified. It's in the record, as Yogi Berra says, you can look it up. Uh, and the, the theme of the testimony, to my recollection, is, and again, you have to caveat all of this because Juror reports after a verdict, of course, are, are influenced by the verdict itself, the reaction of the public, and so forth. Uh, but the comments were basically that the government had the burden of proof that it did not meet. In other words, he, he was uh, introduced evidence of insanity, and the government didn't show he was, quote, sane, if you will. Uh, so be it. That is going to show uh, some of the, the aftermath of this case. I want to turn now to that, because it becomes important for our study. And I, I have handed out or will put, put up on the board here three important legal changes in the law. 
well, they're all legal, but they're changes in the law. In 1984, the Congress for the first time decided to regulate the federal insanity defense. And by doing this, they had an enormous effect on how the states, including this state, regulate and conduct the insanity defense. First of all, uh, the standard for criminal responsibility, uh, you see on the left is what the jury was told at the Hinckley trial, whether at the time of the uh, offense did the defendant, as a result of mental disease or defect, remember that elastic definition, lack substantial capacity either to appreciate wrongfulness of his conduct or was unable to conform his behavior to the requirements of law. Okay, Congress said enough of that. In 1984, they enacted what's on the right. Here, they, they did away with the whole volitional part of the test. And it just said, it's an affirmative defense, I'm looking at the right, to a prosecution under any federal statute that at the time of the commission of the acts constituted the offense, and the defendant as a result of severe mental disease or defect, let me pause there. They're changing the standard now to severe mental disease or defect, not just any abnormal condition, was unable to appreciate the nature and quality or wrongfulness of his acts. Mental disease or defect does not otherwise constitute a defense. That has resulted in a sharp diminution in raising of insanity defenses in federal courts. Many of the states followed this in similar fashion. And therefore, the insanity defense, I mean, it's presented, but in far less uh, frequency. Second thing they did is change the burden of proof. Let me put that up in front of you here. Burden of proof at Hinckley was the old standard from 1895, no, uh, number two burden of proof, I'm sorry. There we go. Prosecution at the Hinckley trial must prove the defendant's sanity beyond a reasonable doubt. Davis of U.S. 1895. Now, what a rule. But at the time this was decided, in 1895, psychiatry was certainly not as advanced as it was in 1982 or is now. And therefore, the Supreme Court was comfortable in saying in 1895, if the defendant puts his sanity in issue, it becomes an element that has to be proven beyond a reasonable doubt, like any other element in a criminal case. Okay. Uh, the, the, the jury that was then told it's on the government to prove beyond a reasonable doubt either the defendant was not suffering from a mental disease or defect or else that the, he nevertheless had substantial capacity on that date to conform his conduct to the requirements of the law. If the government, or the wrongfulness, and the government has not established this period of satisfaction beyond a reasonable doubt, then you shall bring in a verdict of not guilty. That's exactly what the judge instructed, and he followed the law settled in federal courts. This was nothing unusual that he did. Congress, on the right hand, side, 1984, said, no more of that. Look what that reads. 18 U.S.C. Section 17B, that should say 1984, typo, I'm sorry, my goodness. The defendant has the burden of proving the defense of insanity by clear and convincing evidence. Whoa. First of all, we've limited the scope of what you can present mental illness-wise for insanity. Here, the defendant has the burden and not only by a preponderance, but by clear and convincing evidence. Clear and convincing evidence is a very, very high standard to meet. A number of states have adopted this burden-shifting approach as well. So again, it's much more difficult to, to do that. Uh, and finally, let me uh, briefly touch on opinion testimony from an expert. At Hinckley, the experts were allowed to give an opinion as to whether the defendant, uh, as a result of his mental condition, lacked substantial capacity to appreciate or conform. Congress amended the Federal Rules of Evidence in 1984, saying no ex expert may give such an opinion on an ultimate issue. Uh, that changes the role of the expert drastically. So these changes, as I say, were affected uh, after the Hinckley case. They have affected the practice in virtually every state. And coupled in federal system with the federal sentencing guidelines, they've made it very risky to raise an insanity defense. Some of you practice in federal court and know about the federal guidelines, and essentially what the federal guidelines say is if you get convicted of a crime, the judge has, uh, let's say, limited discretion about sentencing you within bounds that are quite significant. So now somebody with a, with a possible insanity defense has to factor into the situation. If I raise this defense, I have the burden, I have a limited ability to show mental disorder, I have to show a severe mental disorder, and if I lose, I'm going to get a strong sentence based on the guidelines. So 
not surprisingly, from 1984 to the present, there are very, very few insanity defenses. What this also does, but what is not appearing in the statistics, is it affects the ability of prosecutors to, to plea bargain. In other words, there were times in the past when prosecutors would face defense attorneys and they would say, look, this fellow's so sick, we shouldn't try him and send him to an institution. With the higher standard and the burden on the defendant, that's very, very, very less likely uh, than it would be. Uh, let me pause here before I turn to the other part of what I have to say to get some questions or reactions. Yes. Sure, fair question here. Um, let me add this. Uh, Mr. Hinckley was committed immediately under D.C. law to a mental hospital. And under D.C. law, which is now mirrored in federal law, he must stay there until he shows that he should be released and is no longer dangerous to himself or others. And he has to show that to a judge. Okay? Um, now, to answer your question, uh, he was charged with several armed offenses. Uh, and he could have received, and, and shooting the president and such, he could have received up to life in the judge's discretion. But this was in 1982, and the sentencing would have been in 1982, and of course, parole was then available. Those of you who know the guidelines know that the guidelines came into effect in 1987 and basically eliminated parole. As far as, as the release history goes, and let me comment on that. Um, the trial judge was Barrington Parker, uh, who has now passed, unfortunately. Uh, but periodically, Mr. Hinckley, through his lawyers, would make applications to the court for release. When I was in the office, we, we had hearings and opposed that for various reasons. Uh, I left in 1987. Uh, my my, my uh, colleagues, Dick Chapman and Tom Zeno, have carried the ball since then. Judge Parker, as I say, has passed. Judge June Green had the case, and she denied the release request. And now Mr. Hinckley's case has been assigned by rote to Judge Paul Friedman, another Buffalo native. And Judge Friedman has is, is, uh, been on the bench for, for many years, uh, and he has the task of deciding when and if to release Mr. Hinckley. Periodically, there are hearings. Uh, the hearings focus on several things. One, his mental condition. Two, his behavior at the hospital. There have been some episodes over the years uh, of behavior. I, I have handed out yet another. So you thought you were going to have a free ride here. There's a list of cases here for those interested of the litigation post-NGI. I hope everybody got this. If not, uh, Greg or I will supply this to you. Um, are the various issues involved with Mr. Hinckley? Uh, I recall when I was there, there was an incident where Mr. Hinckley claimed he was totally over Jody Foster. This is in the 80s. But yet a search of his room revealed, I believe, a number of photographs of her and so forth. Um, so, uh, you know, that may be still a, a thing that's on his mind. Uh, Mr. Hinckley has lawyers who, who raise these issues periodically with the judge. The recent focus in the last few years has been releasing Mr. Hinckley. He gets temporary releases in his parents' custody, but the question is whether they are adequate custodians. Not, they are the finest people going, let me tell you that. But they have uh, age, they're in their 80s, and the question is whether he, he can be put in their control. So the judge is, is dealing with that question. Also, from time to time, they have psychiatric testimony about his present mental condition. So this is an ongoing matter. Um, it's not like a parole hearing because there's a specific standard, and he's got the burden. Other question? Yeah. Would have prevented Mr. Hinckley from buying the gun that he did in Dallas. He just walked into a secondhand pawn shop and, and bought it. So yeah, I'm supportive of gun control. Um, if your question contains the other question, whether I think it's effective, well, you know, certainly not always, but there's some states that allow free, you know, somewhat relatively free transmission of weapons. But, uh, so that's one of the benefits, if you will, that came out of this case. Let me say this about Jim Brady uh, and Sarah Brady, too. They've been, been constant campaigners for gun legislation, and then Congressman, now Senator Schumer, uh, sponsored that in the late 80s or early 90s, and it became law, and the Brady Bill is one of the, the highlights of the gun control movement. Handwriting, handwriting to, 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 to judge's mental condition? No. 
No. The question is whether this, the handwriting could be a, a reviewed for a uh, mental condition. I, I would hate to see that happen, because if you've ever seen my handwriting, I think you, you, you would agree. Uh, no, we, we, nobody advanced that. Um, I will say this. There, there are people in psychiatry who will tell you the use of certain phrases in connection with other phrases may, may foreshadow uh, mental, mental disorders and so forth, but uh, not in this case. I should add one other thing, and it's not in the, even in the materials. During the trial, Mr. Hinckley proposed to offer testimony based on a neurologist and a psychiatrist that he had, they took a picture, a CT scan of his brain, that his brain uh, sulci, the, the brain uh, uh, folds, were different than other people, and therefore it's more likely he was schizophrenic. We had a hearing, basically a Daubert-type hearing, you know Daubert, those of you who are lawyers, uh, and the court allowed that in. Uh, in a limited basis, but they did allow in the x-rays and the CT scans of his brain, and who knows what influence that had. The other thing that the defense was permitted to do, many things, is during the trial there was testimony about Mr. Hinckley's interest in Ms. Foster and taxi driver. How many people have seen taxi driver, by the way? Yeah, oh good. Well, um, the defense said, well look, it's important, it's relevant, let's play it. And the judge, over our objection, let him play it. So they played two-hour movie for the jury to see Taxi Driver. <laughs> so make of it what you will. Did they ever, did the defense ever consider That would have been what we would have done, I suppose. <laughs> Not at all. No, he totally followed the law. Any judge would have ruled that way. Now, I think your question is, why is the law like that? Okay. Because the District of Columbia, starting with the Durham case in 1954, had adopted a very liberal view of the insanity defense. The Durham opinion, way back then, this is history, but it's worth talking about, said that a person could have an insanity defense if his crime was the product of a mental disease or defect. Think how broad that is, product. Okay. I mean, the fact that I'm here today is a product of a lot of things. The airplane I flew on, the car I drove in, all this kind of thing. So that really made uh, the psychiatrist's testimony critical and very important. It was narrowed to some degree in a case called Brawner in 1972. But Judge Parker went right by the book in terms of what the law was. Uh, I, I uh, you know, don't have any quarrels with that. Well, sort of a lead into what I want to talk how did, about. How did it feel? Like, what was it well, like? yeah, we were not happy. We obviously wanted well, a verdict in our favor. Um, but uh, as I told Greg, there are two great American pastimes, uh, and I engage in, in one of them, baseball, and uh, the other great American pastime is second guessing, which, which I don't do. Uh, I'm a trial lawyer. I believe you, you abide by the verdict. I think the question also is, well, do you believe in the insanity defense? I say, yeah, sure. I've seen cases where it's justified. But certainly we're not happy. Nobody was happy with that result. Um, I don't have the materials quite at hand, but there was some very, very sharp criticism, not at the government or the FBI or us, but at the, at the, at the system, if you will, to allow this guy to be quote free. Because at the time, everybody thought, oh, he's going to go scot-free. Well, he hasn't. Uh, certainly, we would have liked to have, have won, no question about it. So to that extent, you won. Yeah, but we didn't think of it then. Nobody, nobody, nobody could have told me that 25 years later, that he'd still be in custody. It was just, you know, it wasn't... A, well, that's speculation. I don't know. I, I will say, th let, me, let me answer your question this way. There were a couple of things uh, that I mentioned to you that I thought, well, I wouldn't change the verdict, but we would like to have gotten in. And that is the conversation he had with the agents about basketball. You say, what? Yeah. Because immediately after the shooting, he's got the presence of mind to start talking about uh, who he was favoring in the tournament and so forth and so on. That shows he's in contact. That shows he's in contact. But the judge ruled the other way. And, um, you know, um, as I say, we appealed, we lost in the circuit two to one. And then uh, two years later, three years later, the Supreme Court, in another case, basically ruled uh, that we, we, uh, uh, we, that kind of evidence could come in, state of mind evidence. In the, yeah.
Well, mental health court largely is a civil commitment and, and so forth. And uh, it's a good idea, obviously. Um, but in a criminal case, of course, you can't you know, pre-screen those cases. Those are, those are police cases. The mental health court the thing that I'm familiar with is where basically the police see somebody acting strange, they bring him in, they examine him, and so forth. But where somebody commits a crime, you know, you're starting with a, with a criminal charge right away. Or to, if you're asking me whether prosecutors would want to divert criminal cases right into the mental health system, the answer is no. The answer is no. Um, because after all, you know, we trust the jury verdict, and if, if uh, that's the case, and I'm talking about a crime here, not civil actions, uh, we, want this, we want this matter decided by a jury. Yes? Well, you said several things. First of all, the standard is not that he didn't know what he was doing. I'm sorry. Yeah, well, that's important. I'm, I'm, I don't know whether you're a lawyer or not, but you know, we lawyers live, live and die on words. Uh, the, the, the standard now is, is of course, whether uh, because of a serious mental disorder, he, he, he did not appreciate the wrongfulness of his conduct. Okay. Uh, no, I don't think people are being railroaded by that. I think they're being dissuaded from presenting defense. But I made the point about Mr. Hinckley's resources simply to show you that this was a fully contested insanity defense. And whatever people say, there was no stone unturned. What did you feel were the uh, defense's strongest bit of evidence? Well, again, it's speculation, but I, you know, uh, fine. the Jody letter, the fact that he shot uh, this, this uh, uh, four people to, to impress a movie star and so forth and so on. You know, plus those those tapes, the, the midnight tapes and so forth, you know. But again, I, I don't want to be on record as saying I have any particular view. I don't know. Uh, but, you know, and also it, it's, a, it's a collage of evidence, the whole picture, and it has to persuade 12 people. And if they're unanimous, it persuades 12 people different ways. Let me just turn, one more question, then I'll turn. Yeah. And the discussion was after the shooting. Yep. How can the judge... He ruled... You've got recency, primacy. Isn't that really a mistake that that wasn't admitted? Well, I don't know whether you're a lawyer. It does make a difference. You have to know Miranda versus United States. They didn't advise him of his rights. And, well, put it this way. He had asked for a lawyer. Remember I told you that? And they went on and talked to him. That's why. Was that the basis of the yes. Rules? Yes. Okay. He's not. Are, well, are you a, a, an attorney? Yes. Okay. Well, uh, Miranda is a rule. <laughs> That's all right. Miranda is a rule of absolutism. If you, it's a prophylactic rule. If you don't obey the Miranda rules, you suffer. Okay. And one of them was, if a person wants an attorney, you get him an attorney. Okay. You call Joe Bates and so forth. And but yet they talk to him. Uh, and that opinion is, as I say, in these materials here. He wasn't ruling on relevance, he was ruling on constitutional grounds. And, you know, as uh, probably the namesake of this, of this amphitheater in his center has said, you know, the Constitution sometimes yields results that we don't like. But in the long run, we do like them. Oh, yeah. And not only that, he's rooting for LSU. <laughs> so, sure, absolutely. But you know, in much of in much of this of this material, the evidence can be converted both ways. You know, and really, that's that's what advocates do. That's my business. May I, yes. Uh, this is unfair, but I'm going to ask. Oh, good. Well, Oswald's activities occurred in the state of Texas. <laughs> well, no, no, the law, the law is different there, and of course, sure, but yeah. But the, the standard of insanity was never gotten. No, I, well, I think he would have a claim that he didn't do it. You know, he, he would probably not even raise it. I don't know. We, we never, never do 
that. Let me talk just for a second here <clears throat> to, to, to pick up final points that I wanted to make, which is uh, where we are now with a modern complex trial, not, not Hinckley or not Insanity, but things that I do these days. Uh, complex cases involving securities fraud, uh, RICO, and, and other, other matters. And there have been several advances, I think, over time that allow us to put the jury more into the case and, and increase comprehension. Number one is a very simple matter of jury note-taking, to take notes, let the jurors take notes, and follow the case that way. It's a fundamental. Number two, courts now permit, in some cases, questions by the jurors. And the jurors don't get up and say, aha, and they write the questions. They write them for the judge. The judge screens them with the lawyers present, and the judge asks the questions. This is enormously helpful because it raises some things that the lawyers may not have brought out. It also shows you. I like to see the bad questions because if they're asking that question, then some, somebody's not getting it, if you know what I mean. Uh, along with that, the third thing that some judges have introduced are interim summations. In the Hinckley case, it started in the latter April 1982 and around to the middle or end of June. The jurors had to sit there, listen to the case, uh, not ask a question, not because of anything the judge did, it's the way it was then, and then decided. And all these experts testified on about very complex stuff. There are cases now that I've been involved with in federal court where after each expert testifies, maybe each witness, the lawyers for both sides are allowed to give an interim summation, what we call closing argument, it's really a summation. Two minutes, you get up and you say, well, we called Mr. Jones, he testified to this. Then the other side's allowed to get up and give two minutes in rebuttal. It's wonderful because it lets the jury know right then what is important or what is not important. What you can't do, though, is to get up and say, ah, you heard him, but wait till you hear our guy. You, you can't predict down the road. But that's a tremendously helpful device uh, for jury understanding. And as I say, complex cases lend themselves to that. Um, a couple other points. In terms of procedure, I think more and more in civil cases, uh, as in criminal cases, the courts will and should permit what are called summary witnesses, people who gather the evidence and sort of summarize it. They're not allowed to give an opinion on the case, but they can summarize it. Many experts in, in various fields effectively are summary witnesses. Uh, there are some uh, judges, very few, but some have allowed post or inter-deliberation summations. What do I mean by that? When the jury goes out, they deliberate, they deliberate, they come back with a note. What does this mean? What does that mean? The judge, in some occasions, it's not required, it's discretionary, will allow the lawyers to sum up again on that point. I think that's a fascinating idea. All of this, by the way, presumes skilled counsel and counsel that are ethical and counsel that will follow the judge's instructions. But all of these things, I think, you know, make, make the trial uh, practice even now uh, a very, very challenging and, and, and interesting undertaking. The final point I want to close on is, is, is sort of a sad one, which is I, I, I was speaking to a group the other day and they recognized me for something and I said, you know, I'm the member of a, of a dying profession uh, because the jury trial is, is getting less and less a frequent event in our courts. And there are lots of reasons. We talked about it at dinner, as a matter of fact. But there are lots of reasons why uh, jury trials have, have become less and less. And I think, I for one think, not simply from self-interest, but I think from the process's interest and uh, the importance of, uh, uh, you know, the public's perception of what we do that we really need. We really need to encourage jury trials and, and devise the means. I know there are a lot of people here who are members of the judiciary, so I, I appeal to you first of all. I thank you. I'll take questions down here when we're finished. One more. No, no, we used to sequester jurors in D.C. Uh, they were, oh, I'm sorry, they were, they were sequestered during deliberation. Not during the trial. It's an awful imposition on people to be sequestered for weeks at a time. Would you be concerned about that today with all the Yeah, well, look, look uh, over, over the last few years that's happened, but uh, I don't know many juries that have been sequestered now. It's very tough. I, I argued to the judge on sequestration in, in, in our case that, uh, you know, it's not so much the, the jurors hearing the publicity, but their friends and relatives and family. And when they go home, you know, they'll say, hey, did you hear today that the judge, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but sequestration is difficult, not only mechanically, logistically, but also it cuts down the potential pool of jurors. I mean, there are a lot of folks who say, look, I can serve, but I've got, a, I've got three small children, I've got to go home and tend to a family, I've got a job, and so forth. So you just have to hope that they'll abide the oath.
Oh, by Dios. Well, go ahead. Uh, be better part of three days. Jury pool, yeah, it is. Jury pool, uh, I think we qualified, well, we, we started out with probably 100 qualified down to about 40. And we had, we had a lot of individual voir dire, in other words, calling them up at the bench and so forth. Uh, it took a uh, better part of a week. Better part of a week. And, uh, of course, you know, in Washington we have cases, like, like I remember in Watergate, they said, how many of you heard of this case? Well, 99% of the people stood up, so, you know, you, you, but here, of course, it was a bit different because although they'd heard of the case, they hadn't really been tuned into the, the, the defense. But in a place like the District of Columbia that's so small, everybody knows just about every case. I mean, your district is a little different. But uh, so it, it's not common, not uncommon, rather, to see people who have some familiarity with it. And of course, the magic rule the Supreme Court has given us is if the jurors can put aside what they've heard and decide the case on the evidence. And frankly, I'm confident that they do. Final question. Well, thanks. On behalf of the Robert H. Jan Jackson Center, Inns of Court, uh, the Robert H. Jackson Center, and to everybody here, Roger, uh, we can't thank you enough. He did some major league work in preparation for tonight, and it was, it was wonderfully clear. Uh, he would call and, and have ideas as to his timing, his presentation, and uh, it's just a thrill to have you, it was clear that what happened today. And on behalf of the Robert Jackson Center, I want to just give you a little token of our appreciation. This is a book of Robert Jackson's called Country Lawyer, Supreme Court Justice, America's Advocate, autographed by Eugene Gerhardt. Uh, Gene Gerhardt, uh, for those who may not know, he was the only, is uh, the only biographer. Uh, unfortunately, Gene, uh, at age 95, passed away uh, just three days ago. Uh, it's an autographed book, and I want to make sure you got that as something special. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thank you, thank very, you much. very much. So thank you. Thanks, everyone, for coming.